Welcome to the Dr. Berkson's Best Health Radio Show. I am really excited about today's show. Today is all about the heart, not just the emotional heart. It's not that, but the physical heart. We're talking today about cardiology, and I love the saying by Susie Kazam, beauty is in the heart of the beholder, not just the eye, but the heart of the beholder. And then I found another really cool quote. I don't know what you're going to think of this. A beautiful woman is one with a beautiful heart. She may be covered with mud or sores, but only her foot fit the glass slipper. (laughs) So today on the show, we have the iconic functional medicine cardiologist and dear friend and colleague, we have Dr. Mark Houston. And I was lecturing, I think it was over in San Diego, and it was lunchtime, and we were in the center of the hotel sitting down. Both of us, I'd been lecturing that weekend for about seven hours, thinking I was working hard. And Mark was kind of speed up, and he said, oh, I've been working hard. And I said, well, how many hours are you lecturing? He goes, 24. And I said, excuse me? He is the entire functional medicine module. In the gastroenterology module, there's about six professors. In the hormone module, there are about five professors. In the cardiology module, Mark has really made functional medicine what it is, and he teaches the entire 24 hours of the cardiology module. His brand new book is called, which is one of the reasons we're having him here on the show, besides I adore his company, is called Integrative uh, Cardiovascular Medicine. Integrative Cardiovascular Medicine. Most cardiologists aren't aware of this. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about his background, and then I'm going to get him on the show so you can hear him and how great that he really is. If I were to go, if you look at his name on his website, there's so many initials after his name, I would have to ask him to define what all of those are, so I'm not going to mention them. But when we're off air, I'm going to want to know what some of them are. But he's the director. He has a place in Nashville where I go. He is my heart doc. And honestly, I'm a new and improved version of myself since I've been seeing Dr. Houston. Totally true. So he is the director of the Hypertension Institute in Vascular Biology, which is over in Nashville, Tennessee. And I send some of my patients there and I go there. So if you have really serious heart issues, this is a place you should consider. He's the medical director of Division of Human Nutrition. He's the medical director of clinical research. He's a specialist in clinical hypertension. Nobody knows hypertension like Mark. He um, was an associate clinical professor of medicine at the Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. The Hyper Institute, uh, Hypertension Institute was founded by him. He is the director of the Hypertension Institute and also triple board certified in hypertension as an American Society of Hypertension Specialist, a fellow of the American Society of Hypertension and in internal medicine and an anti-aging medicine where we both teach. He also, besides that, has a master's degree in human nutrition and a master's of science degree in functional and metabolic medicine from the University of South Florida, Tampa. Now that's long enough. We're going to end the show right here. We've heard enough. (laughs) So welcome, Dr. Mark. Well, thank you. It's good to be with you. I may just stop after that intro. It was pretty cool. Thank you for all the accolades. Well, you know, I sent some patients to you that had, we'll get into that story later, who saw you and you changed their life. You literally saved both of their lives. And I've gone to you myself and you really lift up the hood and look underneath in a unique way. So graduating med school as a cardiologist is one perspective. How did you go from that typical one perspective to what you do now? We don't get the type of training that I do right now <clears throat> in typical medical school. Um, I went to Vanderbilt Med School and then trained at University of California in San Francisco. So I was a traditional trainee, and I didn't know anything about nutrition. I never heard of functional medicine. So I started uh, going to meetings and figured this was something that I really needed to learn. So for about four or five years, I just dove into it all by myself looking at articles on PubMed, reading books, going to conferences. And then I said,
Yeah, well, uh, I'll make it real brief. My father developed prostate cancer and was told he had maybe six months to live. And uh, I didn't know anything about oncology, but I knew enough to know that there were some things I might be able to do to help him that were not medication, not radiation, not Lupron or some of these other things they were doing. So I looked into prostate cancer, integrative, functional, nutrition, supplement medicine. And I found a whole host of things that no one knew about. I didn't even know about. Presented them to my dad, presented them to a urologist. We did them. He left for three years. Now, you know, three years is a lot of time when it's your parent. Uh, but he loved, uh, it's a good quality life during that time. So I decided based on that, I would look into cardiology and hypertension in the same way. That's when my eyes were open. And then I started getting educated about it. I'm glad I asked you that because I didn't know that story about you, Mark. So I ended up uh, going to a lot of conferences first and then went back and got the two master's degree. (laughs) That was a treat. Four years, not back to back, but two years off and on, on my computer, living by my computer. It was like I was attached to the hip to my computer, taking tests, reading books, answering questions online in the classroom, et cetera. But it was worth it because it changed the way I looked at uh, integrative cardiology. So now everything we do is based on putting medication with nutrition, with supplements, and also with just lifestyle changes. And people do better. Oh, definitely. Definitely. I'll go into that story of some of the people you've saved from my practice in a little bit. But how come there there's so few functional medicine cardiologists? Um, I know you're doing your best to educate them teaching 24 <laughs> hours at a stint. <laughs> you're right. There, there's, there's only a handful in the country. Um, I've certainly trained probably, I mean, it's maybe over 100 cardiologists who were uh, you know, traditional cardiologists in our advanced cardiovascular course over the last, say, 10 years. Now, how many of them are actually doing what I'm doing? I don't know, but at least they've had some of the training. But when you look at what's out there as integrative cardiovascular medicine, probably only four or five in the country right now. Isn't that something? You've been, How many years have you been teaching at A4M Functional Cardiology? Uh, since uh, 2000. Okay, so that- years. That's yeah. 20 years, and there's really only four or five doing anything close to what you're doing. As, Correct. So their change in medicine, as as in change in our own lives, when we want to work on a, a glitch that we have in our personality, change goes slowly, slower than we would like to see it go. But um, I know when we had your last show, I had a lot of patients say that they printed out the whole entire show and gave it to their cardiologist asking for help. And they now were doing, on the cardiology mafia list, right? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it's like, why, why can't it, I find in my own town a cardiologist that will approach me in that way? And that's the part that I don't understand because so much of functional medicine is common sense translated into a new approach of medicine. And I don't know why it's so slow. I just... Well, uh, if you take the base cardiology trainee, <clears throat> they would have to go back and do what I did. They'd have to go back and get a nutrition degree, uh, go to a lot of conferences. That doesn't happen overnight. I mean, this is... Right. You know, it took me, what, five or six years to get all this done. And I was interested in it. I mean, I was motivated. They probably <laughs> would not be as interested, number one, um, not as motivated and maybe not have the time to do it. So the chances of it happening from transition from traditional cardiovascular medicine to integrative is going to take a lot of time. Right. So when a patient comes into your office, how do you look at them differently from a regular cardiologist and how do you test them differently? Well, the whole history is different. The physical exam is different. And all the testing is different. I mean, we do things in the hypertension institute that are rarely done anywhere, uh, even at some of the top medical centers in the country. Can you explain We're those? Able to, go ahead. Can you explain those? Sure. Um, we look at, um, I'll give you the lay term uh, because it's easier for people to understand. We look at the elasticity of the arteries all over the body. Uh, we look at the lining of the arteries called the endothelium. Uh, we look at uh, what's called plasmography, which is how does the heart actually function 
how the coronary arteries function, how the heart muscle functions. We do central blood pressure, arterial stiffness, pulse wave velocity, and then the, some of the more traditional things like echoes and carotid arteries and blood pressure monitoring. And but you do a 24-hour blood pressure monitoring. Yes, that's the key to finding out what's going on with your blood pressure. 24-hour ABMs is a, a, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. That was a lifesaver for many people that I've sent to you. Right. And they couldn't Absolutely. get it. We, at, we, we tried to get that in Victoria and in San Antonio, and we couldn't get anybody to do that. Not many centers even carried the machines. Uh, that pro- probably because most people don't do hypertension as a specialty. I mean, there's not that many in the country, actually, that do hypertension that are certified. I don't have many now, but probably maybe 500 to 1,000 at most in the whole U.S., that have a, a, a American Society of Hypertension Fellowship and Integrative uh, Hypertension. and So it's, it's rare. Okay. Well, I've got a lot of questions about blood pressure, but you were going through what, how your physical is different. I'd like to hear. Yeah. So the physical is different because we, we, it's interesting that uh, a lot of the younger doctors don't even use their stethoscopes anymore. Um, they don't know how to listen to heart, how to pick up a heart murmur. The, the, other, the cardiologists that are graduating from car, being a cardiologist, they don't... Well, not, maybe not the cardiologists so much, but internists and okay. family practitioners, maybe. It's, it's like, well, they'll get a history and they'll go straight to a, a scan, like a, a, a catheterization or a CT scan or something. But the physical has sort of gotten pushed to the side. And I still do the same physical exam I did that I learned when I was not only in training, but I learned from some of the top cardiologists in the University of California, San Francisco. And I put that together with what I think is going to go on. So it directs me into what tests I need to get. But honestly, by the time I get through the history and physical, 95% of the time, I've already figured out what they've got. And the tests usually just confirm it. I remember when I was getting the physical from you, you even really spent a lot of time listening to my breathing. You didn't leave any stone unturned, even though I was going there because I'd turned a certain decade and I wanted you to lift up the hood and look underneath. I didn't know if I had any problems, but I, you found them. But I remember that you really took every single part of my body as, as important. Yeah. I mean, we're literally checked out everything under your hood <laughs> <laughs> because that's what you have to do. You right. don't leave any part of the body not examined because you may find your clinical clue with that piece. And most people would just say, well, I'm not going to look at the eyes today. I'll just listen to the heart. So you've got to do the whole exam. So one of my questions is how come so many people when they hit their seventh decade have high blood pressure? What is it about blood pressure that gets worse as you get older and almost everybody's on blood pressure meds and do you spare some people that can you go into the land of blood pressure so there's there's really two types of hypertension in the older versus the younger patient the older patients typically get stiff arteries uh the aorta particularly gets stiff the larger arteries but also the small ones so the systolic blood pressure which is the top blood pressure goes up fairly high, 160, 180, 200. But because the way the vascular system is arranged with the aorta to like an accordion, which is kind of supposed to be elastic to keep the blood going in and out, the top number goes up really high, but the bottom number actually falls. So an older patient has what's called systolic hypertension. That's which the top the number. Top number is high, the bottom number is low. That one is harder to treat. So if you don't have a healthy lifestyle and you start aging fast. Most people, you know, 60s and 70s have stiff arteries that get systolic hypertension. But younger people, their arteries are usually more elastic, more pliable. So they typically get a little elevation in the systolic, but sometimes more elevation in the diastolic. So they may have something like 140 or 150 over 100, 110. Now you can see that in older people too. But the point that I think you're making is you get older, the stiff arteries give you a different type of high blood pressure. Well, one of the things you do is you you measure if someone's got stiff arteries and then you set about with lifestyle and nutrition to fix it. Because I remember when I used to work with Dr. Jack Moncrief at the dialysis center and he said, buy 
the time people are 70, 95% of people are on blood pressure meds and there's nothing you can do to fix it. Of course, he was coming from a nephrologist point of view and a regular, he's a great guy, wonderful person, but his viewpoint is you're going to have high blood pressure, you're going to need meds. You have these special functional medicine tools to make people's arteries and small capillaries more elastic. How do you do that? So it's a computerized analysis of the arterial system. It's called, it's called computerized arterial pulse wave analysis. Uh, and it measures the small arteries, the medium size, and the large arteries throughout your entire body with a computer. It gives you a printout. And you can look at that. Plus, it gives you their central blood pressure, which is the blood pressure in the aorta as the heart pumps. So with that information, I know exactly what's going on with your arterial system. I know where to attack it to make it better and more elastic, either with a a lifestyle change, a nutrition program, a supplement, or a drug. Because if you don't have that information, it's really hard to know what to give them to treat them. So when when you hear people getting blood pressure meds from doctors, it seems like it's catch-as-catch-can. And then there's all these caveats of articles coming out. Wasn't there a whole bunch of articles lately on the Sartan? blood pressure meds. So can you talk about all that, like compare the blood pressure meds and compare them to the nutritional and who might respond? Because so many people out there listening, even if they're a medical doctor, nurse practitioner, many people are battling blood pressure issues themselves. Well, if you look at statistics, 50% of the people in the U.S. have high blood pressure. So it's the most common medical disease in the United States and the number one reason people come to a physician's office. So no matter what you're doing in medicine, you have to know about high blood pressure. It's just that you're not trained perhaps to know it as well as if you get a a specialty in it. So what happens basically is the arteries get stiff. The, The back pressure against the heart makes the heart now have to overwork. Now it gets stiff or it enlarges. So now you've got problems with the blood vessels peripherally, but also now the heart's getting into problems. And then that pressure that's going out to all the arteries can affect the brain. So that's a stroke. Uh, also, it can affect the heart to get hypertrophy, heart failure, or blockage in the arteries. Coronary hypertrophy is enlarged heart. Yeah, or a heart attack. And it obviously can affect the kidneys. And you get kidney failure or end-stage kidney disease. Um, our approach is basically to treat everything we can and we get specialized tests to figure out what kind of high blood pressure do you have? And that requires blood tests, urine tests, and these non-invasive vascular tests. So we don't do this hit or miss thing. So we know what is going on, what type of hypertension you have. We know your genetics. So that's very right, you, you do a whole scan of genes that are related to the heart. There are like 59 genes or something that you test. It's uh, actually it's about 25 for cardiovascular, but they're blood pressure genes, cholesterol genes, heart genes, whatever, diabetes genes. So if someone has, for example, resistant hypertension, and they've been going to a doctor for 10 years and they've taken every medicine on the market, then one's ever checked their genetics. We do that, and we know exactly what medicine is going to work for them. And often, they've never even gotten that medication. And so, it's, a, it's an eye-opener. And instead of taking five medicines, we're often able to give them one or two and get their pressure to normal. So, there's a lot of drug classes we can use. Uh, and the importance is to combine nutrition like the DASH-2 diet, Mediterranean diet, various supplements that work for high blood pressure, and then the drugs and there's, you know, diuretics, beta blockers, uh, calcium channel blockers, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, some better than others. Uh, for example, we don't use a lot of beta blockers anymore except for some of the newer ones. And we don't use one of the older Why diuretics. is that? Why is that? They were shown in clinical trials not to actually reduce heart attack and stroke. Um, and they were recommended literally from JNC1 through JNC7, which is the Joint National Committee on Hypertension in the United States. So it took 40 years for them to finally figure out that beta blockers were not good drugs for hypertension. Now, it's okay to use them in heart failure and heart attack and that sort of thing, but not for high blood pressure. There's a two, there's two beta blockers we do use, but most of them we don't for hypertension. Which beta blockers do you use? The best one is Bistolic. That's the, the brand name. And the other one, the brand name is Coreg. 
That's the only two that I use for hypertension. But I don't I don't use those that much compared to the other agents like ACE inhibitors are great, ARBs are great, um, and calcium channel blockers are great. I've got uh, a question one, before we leave. Oh, I, you were going to jump into something, so I don't yeah, know. If you one wanted. diuretic that has yeah. been totally outlawed, basically now from treating hypertension. And this is really important for your viewers: hydrochlorothiazide, uh, also abbreviated HCTZ. It's a single diuretic, but it also is combined with other drugs. And at our me- meeting in 2019, the American Society of Hypertension, the American Heart Association. Uh, and the American Council on High Blood Pressure said no longer is hydrochlorothiazide to be used in hypertension because it does not reduce stroke and heart attack or has too many side effects or both. Wow, that's interesting. I had a labyrinthitis and the ear doctor was telling me I needed to take that for life. And I just figured out an herbal other treatment. I wasn't going to take the med for life, but that was just recently. But um, the question I have on beta blocker, uh, Avram Blooming just published an article that was looking into a different topic on the women's health initiative. And one of the references he gave is that um, for Mm -hmm. medications that were linked to an increased incidence of breast cancer, he said beta blockers were linked to an increased risk of breast cancer. So I looked it up on PubMed and there were articles that investigated it, but couldn't find it. Articles that investigated a benefit. I could, I didn't, I really couldn't even tease it apart. Have, do you know anything about that, Mark? I've never seen any articles that definitively said that beta blockers cause breast cancer. No. Okay. Okay. I was just wondering about that. What about the whole Sartan deal? Well, what happened with uh, a lot of our blood pressure meds is they were made in China and they were spiked with. I hate to know what toxins, mercury, um, all kinds of bad stuff. So the production of a lot of blood pressure drugs is mostly the sartans initially. Low sartan was the one that really got hit hard, but there were others. Uh, out of China, had to be banned, so we had a shortage. Now that's probably going to happen with a lot of drugs right now because China is basically shut down. Right, right. Uh, There's no toilet paper anywhere at the moment. (laughs) And, uh, you know, we, the United States, uh, unfortunately, made some very bad decisions over the last 40, 50 years by sending a lot of our, not just drugs, but a lot of things to China to make. And now we're going to experience probably some shortages in drugs coming into the United States. That's going to be a problem for patients who need drugs who may not have them. That's scary. Um, right. The government's doing everything they can to try to increase production in other areas, but anything out of China, you're not going to get right now. So one of the other questions I have with Sartan is that the Mayo Clinic mm-hmm. discovered, and I think I sent this to you, I don't know if you remember this, but the Mayo Clinic discovered that in some patients on the Sartan family blood pressure meds, they can get an intestinal set of issues that appear to be like celiac sprue. So in other words, the villi get blunted and you get some damage to the gut from taking that medicine and people who maybe are genetically predisposed. Is there any way to know if you're on a certain med, if that might be ding in your gut or not? The only one that's had that problem is Olima Sartan. Um, the brand name is Benicar. Most of the other Sartans do not have that GI problem that we know about. It's only with that one class. So I think it's the, the chemical structure of Olimisartan that makes that happen. And the other Sartans have a different chemical structure. Oh, okay. Even they're in the same class. And we haven't had any reports of GI problems with any of the other Sartans. Well, I have a patient that I just got recently, this marvelous, marvelous woman, and she had her genetic testing done by some doctor a hypertension doctor who told her that she had the genes that she needed that Benic how do you pronounce that Benicar? Yeah. She needed that that and she has terrible gut issues. So I well, sent her all this there's data. There's like seven or eight other sartans. Okay. That she can take that okay. are equally good to Benicar. So that that shouldn't be an issue for her. Okay, that's good to know. That's good to know. So are there any um do's or don'ts that people out there that are being prescribed some meds should keep in the back of their mind um, from your show when yes. they're getting uh, meds? The do's are take the best drugs that have the best clinical evidence to reduce stroke, heart attack, heart failure, and kidney problems. And those are ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, 
calcium channel blockers, particularly amlodipine, which is Norvasc, and only one diuretic would I recommend. It's called endapamide, and the brand name is Lozol. That's your top drugs. You don't want to take any of the older beta blockers. You can take the newer ones if you want to, like I mentioned, Vistolic and Coreg. Um, and you don't want to take uh, hydrochlorothiazide because of the lack of efficacy and side effects. There's a few rare drugs that we use, but those are more specialty related for hypertension specialists like spironolactone, and amiloride. But um, most doctors don't prescribe those because they're not familiar with them. Now, I've got a question on that. So I've got a girlfriend who's a medical doc and um, she's had n- resistant hypertension her entire life. And her newer doc did a genetic testing on her and told her she could use spiralactone, that if she went on that plus her blood pressure meds, she'd get a response. And now the next day she went down to normal blood pressure for mm-hmm. the first time in her life, although it's still a bit erratic. What it, Can you explain what spiralactone was doing? And can you explain the genetic test he might've been looking at that guided him to add that to her mix? Yeah, so um, there's a hormone made in your body called aldosterone. It's made by the adrenal gland, and it elevates blood pressure and causes fluid retention, salt and water overload. But it also is damaging to the arterial system in the heart. There's three really bad effects. That can be overproduced in a lot of situations, uh, genetically by different genes that are related to an increase in aldosterone production. You can see it also with tumors or adrenal gland tumors um, that have to be removed because that's a structural problem. More than likely, uh, if he did a genetic test, he did one of those that I typically do. Uh, and uh, in w- what it is, it's an aldosterone gene that produces too much aldosterone. Oh, and so when you see that. the lactone blocks the effect uh, on all the different vascular tissues in the heart. That now, is good to know. If it's an adrenal adenoma, or hyperplasia of the adrenal gland, the adenomas are surgically removed uh, because it's the best treatment. And if it's hyperplasia, then you're kind of stuck with medical therapy most of the time. So, you know, your adrenal gland has like two separate glands and you've got the outer gland that makes the cord- cortisol that everyone considers part main part of the adrenal gland, but you don't think of the, medular, the medulla part as making the aldosterone. And, you know, Jonathan writes down all his research showing that if you have too little aldosterone, especially in men, that you tend to have a higher risk of uh, deafness. So he's been doing this long-term non-controlled <clears throat> trial of giving aldosterone, 125 right. micrograms to men with deafness, and about three out of 10 guys respond. It's not a huge response rate, but if it's you, it's huge. So it's kind of interesting that aldosterone has all these different effects. Yeah, and there's another drug we use uh, because spironolactone causes breast enlargement and breast tenderness in men. Women don't mind it, but men don't like it at all. Um, but the other one that's used is a plurinone, which is sort of a aldosterone blocking light drug, but has fewer of the hormone side effects. Oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. So I remember when you did the genetic panel on me, one of the things you did that was life-saving for me was you said I had issues with my APOC3 gene. And it was, it was glitchy, it had polymorphisms, and it didn't function well, so that no matter what my good cholesterol levels look like, my good cholesterol didn't do the best job of right. good cholesterol, which is to pick up your cholesterol from your distant tissues and garbage collect it back to your liver to help make sure you have the normal healthy levels of cholesterol. So you told me there was a medical food. And you told me I should consume pomegranate arils. And I thought with your southern accent, what the heck is an aril? An arrow. I I wasn't. What is he saying? <laughs> what in the heck is he saying? And you were you meant the pomegranate seeds, but the true name is arrow. Yeah. And, right. um, so then I went around get. I have my freezer just filled with them, and then I ended up writing an article on it for the Townsend letter, which got picked up by a medical society. And now we're putting out into the world <laughs> from you finding that glitchy gene in me. <laughs> You're and the I'm feeling, guru now, aren't you? And yeah. I'm feeling better than ever. And what also is striking to me is you measure, besides the genetic panel, you have a number of molecules that you want to be in the just right Goldilocks zone. So I want to know some of these molecules and how you decided. Like one of them is 
asymmetric dimethyl arginine. Can you talk about, I call them the molecules of mass destruction now. That's my uh, umbrella uh, term. But can you yeah. go through some of those molecules and explain what they do and why you need the Goldilocks just right amount? Yeah, sure. So um, <laughs> we do advanced blood tests to measure all the different cardiovascular molecules, risk factors, uh, mass destruction molecules, whatever you want to call them. Uh, ADMA, for example, asymmetric dimethyl arginine, uh, is a nasty one because it blocks the effect of nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is the master regulator of blood pressure and atherosclerosis and heart disease. And if you have low nitric oxide levels, you're at risk for strokes and heart attacks and kidney disease. So a high ADMA is a marker for bad events in your life with cardiovascular problems. And you can lower ADMA with a lot of different methodologies, uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, Neo 40, which is a beetroot extract, eating beets, eating kale, eating spinach, and getting rid of the reason you have it. And most of the time, this is an unrelated, uh, excuse me, a related problem like diabetes or high cholesterol or high blood pressure. So attack the problem, remove the problem, and give one of these agents to replace it. We also measure. Now, what, what, just a question, because it's kind of like me, because I had elevated you did. Um, ADMA, and um, I was eating kale and beets and taking nitric oxide and exercising, but I only had that one kidney. Now, maybe that was from it, but when you have someone that's doing all the right things, although now we've, I've done everything you told me to do, and my kidney's healthier than it's ever been, but um, isn't it? frustrating and exasperating when you have people that live a solid lifestyle, but they still have these damaging molecules of mass destruction. Well, they do live a good lifestyle for the most part, but you usually find something they're not doing correct. And then the other missing piece is no one's ever checked their genetics to put that together with what's called gene expression treatments. Right, right. That's where you just really soar. Can you go through your other molecules? Because on your readout, which is about like 80 pages, which is brilliant, you have this whole list of molecules. And some of them I, I had to run to Google, you know, Professor yeah. Google. And so he- another big one is myeloperoxidase or MPO. And MPO is really nasty because it causes oxidative stress, makes plaque rupture in the heart, causes heart attacks, increases the blood pressure. And MPO also makes your HDL not work, which is what you had, HDL dysfunction. Right. So you can't clean up the the garbage in your your cells. And so if you have an elevated MPO, uh, it's interesting. The treatment that I gave you for your ADMA is the same treatment for high MPO, which is pomegranate. (laughs) Pomegranate's like... There's other things that work too, but like Neo40, but that's good. And uh, so the other just, just to make that comment on Neo Forty, you can get Neo Forty. You could get the professional brand or the regular brand. My girlfriend Janet Sand uh, designed it with um, uh, Nathan. I'm trying to remember Nathan's last Brian. Brian. Nathan. Nathan Brian and I did a whole two three year research and published a study together with the um, the, the School of Medicine in Houston using Neo Forty and testing it on patients that were being dialyzed. But what the way they made it. Mm-hmm. is it's a lozenge of beet powder, which is known to help your heart. And then Janet Sand, the master herbalist, put in Chinese herbs. So it's a lozenge yep. with that combination, right? Exactly. And we checked uh, some what I call cardiac fibrosis markers. What are uh, those? Yeah. Uh, these are complicated names, but Delectin-3 is, is one of them. I think I think you had a few of these that we addressed. So I wanted to just tell you this. So my Galactin-3 was off the chart, and yeah. I called up my old DES mentors from Tulane, and a number of these molecules, which blew me out of the water, were elevated in me. I said, "How? which of these molecules do you know that DEF, DES offspring, my mother took diethylstabestrol mm. as a prenatal vitamin, she was pregnant with me, the offspring are called DES offspring. Did you know anything about these molecules in DES offspring? And so William Toscano and John McLaughlin said to me, we have known that galactin-3 is elevated in DES offspring forever. In fact, in Syrian hamsters, when we induce exposure in utero to DES, they all get kidney tumors. And we've known for years that it was galactin-3 driven. Wow. 
is that something? But what we've done is with everything that you've given me, we've normalized those levels. But unless you know that, but how many cardiologists? Yeah, and then I went and looked, and the Cleveland Clinic and other prestigious institutions have about 350 peer review articles on this, but nobody here in Austin is running these molecules. Yeah, I mean, there's a huge amount of data, but let's face it, it's not one of those tests that most people will even get. Right. Yeah. And now I run it on every single patient. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, you, if you run it, particularly in high risk people, you'll find it. Right. Yeah. And of course, you know, we do advanced lipid testing to look at all those particle sizes and can you mention a little bit about that, about what people should know? But, you know, most people get total cholesterol, HDL, and then if now they, can you mention this a little bit and sure. go run with it? Well, the traditional lipid test that people now get is really obsolete. It's, uh, it's, <laughs> I'd say it's paleolithic medicine, right? <laughs> um, and if you really want to know what your lipids are, you have to do advanced lipid testing. Now, let me give you a real simple example that your, your listeners will remember. You have two garbage cans in your backyard, okay? And you walk out with them and you say, can you tell me what's in each garbage can? And I say, well, no, I can't. I can't tell you because I can't see inside. Well, why don't you go pick up the lid and look? So garbage one can has basketballs in it. Garbage can number two has ping pong balls in it. And I say, if that's your LDL garbage can, which LDL is the worst? The basketballs or the ping pong balls? And most, pe- most people have no idea what I'm talking about, but they'll say, I don't like the fact that there's too many ping pong balls. There's more of them. And that's, that's exactly right because they're small. There's a lot of them. And what that is, is LDL particle number and LDL size. Those are the ones that go right through the arterial wall and cause plaque formation and heart attacks. The big basketball. What's their name? What's their name? Uh, what's called LDL particle number. Okay. Small, dense LDL. Okay. Small, dense LDL. Right. Now, and the other side was the basketball. That's big LDL. Now, it's not to say that it can't cause problems, but it doesn't wreak havoc as much as the small ones. Right. So unless you know that, you don't know what your risk is, number one, and you don't know what to treat them with. So how would you possibly say, well, your LDL is 100 when you didn't pick up the garbage can lid and see what's inside? That's number one, okay? Number two is your HDL. If you get a spot HDL, it doesn't mean anything anymore. Right. It Mine looked great, nothing. but it was dysfunctional. It they hadn't gone to HDL therapy. <laughs> because HDL has to work. Okay. Just because it's high or low doesn't mean it's bad or good. It just means, yeah, it's high or low. You're talking so about you functional medicine. Right. Functional HDL, which we now can do. It makes so much sense when you explain it. And yet it's a desert out there to really get it as a patient. Right. So you're looking at the functionality, you're a functional cardiologist, and you're looking at the functionality of the numbers we're looking at in the blood work. Otherwise, it's paleolithic medicine. Yeah, you look at, look at the lab test and you, and you figure out, well, what is that doing to you? What is it or what is it not doing? You know, in case of dysfunction, it means it's not doing what it's supposed to. It's not cleaning up the mess. And when you figure all that out and put the whole picture together, it always fits. It always fits. Because you have every test that says, you know, you have this, you have that. You have two tests or three tests that say the same thing. There's a collaboration among the tests. They talk to each other. <laughs> you get a good answer. But when you left, we had had you pretty well figured out until most of the follow-up tests came in. I love when a handsome man tells me he has me pretty well figured out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that, makes that my mind. would be an enigma, right? <laughs> So I have another question for you. When I worked with Dr. Moncrief, of course, he co-invented continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis. That means the home unit of dialysis. Everybody knows Jack Moncrief. He invented telemedicine. He got Bush to write the bill. He's like a visionary doc. And I had, I have had such a great life to be friends with geniuses like him and you. And he would say that the kidneys drive the heart. And Chinese medicine doctors have been saying this for years, the kidney drives the heart. And what I noticed in your molecules, I'm going back to the molecules of mass destruction for a minute. Those same molecules that you measure to see if, because if they're too high, they're stressing out the heart. 
are the same exact molecules that stress out the kidney. And is, is that, so the same, mo- so the, the kidney and the heart, and it's also probably the brain, mm-hmm. I think, are, yeah. is, is, so all the major organs are adversely affected by this, but is that, can you come, th- that seemed to explain to me the statement that Jack used to say in my ear all the time, the kidneys drive the heart, and if the person were to live long enough, you know, you'd figure it out that they had kidney disease, not just heart disease. Yeah. Does that well, explain he, it to you? What he's saying to you is now the mantra of cardiovascular medicine. And when I teach my students, the very first thing I tell them is if you learn the basic foundation of cardiovascular medicine, that is the vascular biology piece, and you really understand it, it is applicable to every other disease in your body, your brain, your heart, your GI tract, whatever, endocrinology, doesn't matter because the finite response theory, which is related to CVD, cardiovascular disease, is the same. Uh, the processes are the same. And that's where people don't really get, I think, functional versus traditional. We think process. Traditional medicine thinks disease. And the processes for every disease are virtually identical. The process treatment is very similar for mo- most diseases. So if I tell you I could teach you vascular biology and you say, well, I don't want to be a cardiologist. I want to be a neurologist. I want to be a gastroenterologist. I said, well, that's fine, but you're going to have you're going to take the same processes over to your other discipline, and you'll be able to understand it better because you're thinking differently than you would be if you just looked at traditional disease process. That is so true, but I wish that people grok that, you know, the old Heinlein term of grokking it. Because, for example, my best girlfriend's been my soulmate my whole life. I, I have this woman that's one of the best people that ever walked the planet, ever. Ever. Everyone that meets her wants her to be their best friend, but no, I'm her best friend. And she's so fabulous. And she has a fabulous husband whose father died early of heart disease. And his whole life, he's had a lot of heart issues. And he sees a cardiologist. And I keep saying, I want you to go see, you know, Dr. Mark in Houston, uh, not in Nashville, Dr. Houston in Nashville. I was getting tripped over my own tongue. And for a long, long time, he said, well, I really like this guy. I enjoy seeing him. You know, he doesn't understand that his doctor doesn't understand this functional understanding of the heart, that there's so few that do it. But he happened to listen to another show recently. Now I'm going to be sending him this show because it really clarifies that even though you like your doc, even though they are a good doc, it doesn't mean they're looking at every nook and cranny of you and the functionality of everything of you to keep you as healthy as possible. Yeah, and we work uh, very closely with referring physicians who don't do what I do. And that's fine because we send them back, they maintain their program, go in for regular checkups, and then maybe once every six months or a year, they'll come back to the Institute for a follow-up and tweak them to make sure that everything they were doing is working. So you could, if we were to send this lovely gentleman that I adore to you, you could then become a team player with his oh, local. Oh, absolutely. Car- that's, that's what okay. we do. Yeah, we don't. We have no intention whatsoever of ever trying to take over the care of the patient who's referred by another physician. We're there to consult and help them, and that's what we try to do. So if you're wondering if the Hypertension Institute of Nashville might be a place for you to go, realize that this place would, where you get looked at with a fine-tooth comb in a way that you can't get looked at anywhere else if you've got heart or blood pressure issues, will work together with your local doc so you're not b- betraying the confidence exactly. relationship you have. Yeah. That's good to know. That's really good to know. I'd like to share a story of a patient I sent to them and for you to talk. So I had this, these people that I adore. Of course, I fall. You know, when I lost most of my own family, I got really, really depressed because I don't know too many people that don't really have relatives. So I don't like to stay depressed because this is your life ticking away. So I decided to fall totally madly, passionately in love with everybody in the universe so that the family of mankind was my family. So I really do love the majority of my patients and the people I meet in life. So I had this couple that I totally love. And she um, had 
worked along with me for many years and gotten rid of many of her issues. But the one thing she could never get rid of was waking up in the middle of the night with a lot of anxiety and having terrible insomnia. And I sent her to several local cardiologists and her blood pressure was normal. All their testing was normal. And they kept giving her a a clean slate and it didn't ring well with me. And you and I had dinner in Nashville with Dr. Jack so there were the three of us having dinner. You were having your famous uh, Pinot Noir <laughs> wine with your meal. And I mentioned her to you. And I had tr- you said she really should have a 24-hour blood pressure to find out what her blood pressure is when she wakes up with anxiety the same exact time every night. And nobody, once I had that information, we requested it. Nobody would do that. So we sent her to you. And you put her on a 24-hour halter monitor. And at the time that she woke up in the evening, her blood pressure was something like 220 over 120. It was ghastly high, which you gave her a blood pressure medicine before she went to bed, which stopped it immediately, which no one else knew what to do. But you said that's only a symptom. She actually has other things. And you discovered the stiffness of a chamber that nobody else discovered in all their testing. And now she's totally fine. You said if she'd gone on, she would have uh, been at the risk of fatal congestive heart failure in a very short period of time. So now she's totally fine. Why was it that after having three or four cardiology workups with really good docs here, they couldn't find that stiffened chamber? Um, I'm not sure I know the answer, but I would say this. If you listen to your patients and you take a really good history, you pretty well know what the problem is before you even order the test. Uh, So I knew she had nocturnal hypertension. I knew she had nocturnal tachycardia. Okay. Guide us through how you knew it. Oh, sorry. I'm using big words here. Uh, I knew she had uh, high blood pressure in the middle of the night because she was waking up the same time every night in the what's called the diurnal variation of blood pressure is highest in everybody in the morning it starts around 3 a.m. and it goes up to around 10 a.m. But if you have stiff arteries, then that exacerbation is dramatic. So I already knew that she had probably hypertension waking her up and that she probably had stiff arteries because she was really waking up with major anxiety. And that's the release of adrenaline catecholamine, steroids, other things, at that time of day, pressure goes through the roof. Arteries can't elast, they're not elastic. So they just, you know, 200 over 120, just really quickly. And it does usually shows you with a fast heart rate as well. So I just, when I got the twin for ABM and the halter and the arterial stiffness index, it all fit my hypothesis. But most cardiologists don't have those machines or they don't use them. Because they're not their their priority is not hypertension. It's really more interventional cardiovascular medicine, which is you know, arteriograms, stents, bypass grafts, etc. Most cardiologists are not hypertension specialists. Very few are, in fact. So it's really where you go and what you do to figure this out. That's so key. important to where you go and who you hang with. It's everybody you. Know. It's always who you know. It really is. Honestly, good people. I, I wouldn't be as healthy. I'm healthier now than I've ever been in my life. And a big part of that is well, having awesome. You look great. And I'm glad you're healthy. Well, That's thank awesome. you. Thank you so much. Now, can you talk about stints? Because a lot of people go, well, I just got plaque in my arteries. I'm just going to go on statins and get stints and I'm fine to go. Can you give your comments on that? <laughs> well, so uh, plumber's helper is a great way to get rid of the plumbing problem short term. But once again, you got to back up. What's the process by which you got the plaque to begin with? And let's say, okay, I put a stent in and I get rid of that big old plaque. But did I stop the process with the stent? No. Did I stop the process with the statin? Maybe a little bit, but what's underneath all that? And that's got what you have to figure out. So you put them on a, a program after you figure out what's caused all this to stop plaque formation. And you can't stop plaque formation just by giving a statin. It's a lot more complicated than that. What do you think of statins? We had Dr. Brownstein on the show, and he gave an incredible um, 
dialogue on why he thought that statins really didn't do what they're supposed to do. And I was wondering what you thought about them and how often do you use them if you do? Yeah. I think the key here is knowing when to use a statin, knowing how to use a statin, knowing what side effects they cause and treating them. Statins are great uh, for the right indication. They're life-saving uh, for bypass graft and post-stent. Uh, people at plaque in their neck and their arteries. So very, very respected for LDL cholesterol reduction, but also inflammation. Statins are great for inflammation, but they're not the answer to the cholesterol problem. They're not the answer to coronary heart disease and heart attack. Half the people who go into a hospital with heart attack who are on a statin and have their LDL cholesterol control. So you're missing 50% of the heart attacks just by giving a statin and you're not doing everything you need to to look at the process. So that's why we look at the entire issue of how you make plaque and use a program that's much more sophisticated than just statin use. So then I want to ask you about higher cholesterol in older women. Um, one of my girlfriends, Christine Green, is an infectious disease specialist. She was on the show talking. She's an expert on tick-borne illnesses. But she was at a conference. She called me up and she said, this guy opened our conference. And he said, women, especially older women with the highest level of cholesterol, live the longest and the healthiest. So about three weeks ago, an article was spun off of the Women's Health Initiative and it was uh, published in peer review, and they said what they noticed is that for women over 65 years old, the women, and of course, the Women's Health Initiative was looking at how do we caretake our aging women to keep, not topple Medicare. So the women who are over 65 that have the highest level of, higher levels of cholesterol have the best longevity and the highest quality of life. So the conclusion of the article was maybe we should rethink our pharmaceutical intervention for high cholesterol in aging women. Can you comment on that? Certainly. Uh, the, the use of statins in an elderly in general is, is controversial. Um, the use for statins in is what's called primary prevention. That is, you have nothing wrong with you. You just have a high cholesterol has not really been proven, particularly in women. So I think you're right on point, which is if you're an elderly female and your cholesterol is high and you don't have any other problems, there's no significant scientific proof that you should be lowering your cholesterol for any reason, particularly with a statin. So that is big news because every day in my office, and now when I go to Naples, people or women are coming in going, well, I've been on the statin and I haven't been feeling so hot on it, but, you know, my doctor says I need to keep my cholesterol down and I go, well, you know, and it's not a person with heart disease, just like you're saying. Um, but do you think everyone with heart disease needs a statin if they have high if cholesterol? If you have known coronary heart disease, that is plaque in your arteries, in your heart or in your neck or in other areas or atherosclerosis in general, you've had a heart attack, uh, you've had a bypass graft, or you've had a stent, uh, you should be on a statin. That's, that's, that's pretty well proven to be effective. But once you start the statin, you have to be sure that you don't have side effects from it. And there's 10 different nutrients that are get depleted when you take a statin. Can you and mention doctors, those? Can you mention yeah, those? Most doctors don't uh, even measure them, much less treat them. So um, off the top of my head, let's see if I can start with the most common ones. Coenzyme Q10, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, vitamin E, vitamin A, vitamin D, carnitine, creatine, uh, heme A. How many have I got so far? Uh, you've got... <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're just missing two. I'm only missing two. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, oh, it's uh, tocopherols. Uh, it's a di there's a different form of vitamin E. Oh, you mean tocotrienols? Yeah, there's two forms. Tocotrienols. Right, the tocopherols and tocotrienols, and it lowers both of those. So you yeah, should, if you, yeah, so you should not. take a mixed tocopherol with tocotrienols if you're on statins. Okay. Yes, yeah, both of them. So that gives us our ten. Well, no, you need one more. I need one more. <laughs> 
<laughs> You're being a tough teacher. Today. Okay, I'm not going to. I'm not going to come to me shortly. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send you a link to the show that I had with Dr. Brownstein, and I would love to have you listen. If you don't mind, when you're on a plane somewhere, I don't mean to burden you with that. I know you have nine million things. You have a brand new book that you just came out that we want to talk about before we're coming close to our end of time here. But if you get a chance to listen to this, he was saying that the statistics behind the efficacy of statins really doesn't hold true. And I'd love to hear your response to what Dr. Yeah, Brownstein said. Yeah, I'd be glad to said. read that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, great. Well, can you talk a little bit about your new book and hold it up for Yeah, let me show you have... the book first. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you see it? Integrative Cardiovascular Medicine. Look, if you don't read it, you could do weightlifting with it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so here's the key. See the top two words? Activate your ebook. <laughs> <laughs> we'll go down, go down to the next. Oh, says, oh I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And personal. <laughs> Underneath the activate your activate ebook, your ebook yeah. so is personal and personalized. Here's, here's the, this is the key phrase for 2020 personalized and precision medicine. Now, I took it just to cardiovascular to integrate it. So, what that means is when you come in, you're not what's called the bell shaped curve anymore, which is the statistics out in the real world. You're one of a kind. You're it. What we find in you is personalized. So we do everything we can to find out what's wrong with you. And then when we find out what's wrong with you, that's the personalized piece. We treat you with great precision to make sure that everything we find is corrected. That's what it means. That is really inspirational. I mean, honestly, I would not be who I am today without having known you. And I know that you practice everything that you preach as well as you do it with your patients. And so this book is for um, practitioners and nurse practitioners, yes. pharmacists, doctors, cardiologists, anyone who wants to understand functional cardiology. This isn't a lay book. This isn't something that you're going to read on your honeymoon to each other while munching on chocolate covered strawberries. Probably not. No. <laughs> But it's, what are your other if you books? Did, that you, you'd probably be divorced pretty quickly. <laughs> you should read Sexy Brain, my book that yeah, a that lot of couples better. have read that have kept them together. What are your other books that you've written, Dr. Mark? Well, I've ha I have eight now, and some of these are for lay people. Um, the one I would recommend for your audience is what your doctor may not tell you about heart disease. And the other one is what your doctor may not tell you about high blood pressure. So, so if you those have, fit right into what right. we've talked about today. And those are written for lay people. And what are the ones for the practitioners? So this one we just wrote. There's another one on vascular biology for the clinician. That just came out. My new blood pressure book will be coming out in about four months. And it's the update from the previous version that we had. Uh, then we have another one I did with Dr. Stephen Sinatra, who you know well. And that is on nutritional strategies in cardiovascular medicine. And that's a really good book. That one is kind of geared toward both doctors, but also lay people can read that one. A lot of good nutritional clues uh, in that one. You know, I remember I, he and I lectured together at the American Holistic Medical Association. And he said one of the most amazing open, opening lines that I've never forgotten when he lectured. He stood up and he said, I've been a cardiologist for 40 years. For the first 30 years, it's like I practiced with a paper bag over my head. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have all these, this is what he said. It was a brilliant opening. He said, I had so many patients that had heart failure that had to go to surgery and some we could help and some we couldn't. But the last 10 years of my practice, I discovered nutrition herbs, and hormones. And now most of those patients that I would have sent to surgery and might not have made it, most of them don't need surgery. I no longer have the paper bag on my head. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> that sounds like Steve Sinatra. He's, he's, he's a great physician. He's a really good friend of mine. He's one of the nicest people I'd ever want to meet. Oh, he is. He yeah. is. Well, you're about one of the nicest people I've ever wanted to meet. In fact, I really hope before I die, before my maker calls me away, I want to have a vacation <laughs> with you and your beautiful <laughs> wife. 
<laughs> I want to go play somewhere with you and relax and have yeah, we'll fun. Read, we'll read this book on our holiday. <laughs> <laughs> with chocolate-covered asparagus. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wonderful having you on the show. I know a lot of people listen and take to heart, which is a double entendre, what you're saying, because it's going to be so helpful. And don't forget, if you go to the Hypertension Institute to see Dr. Mark, he can work in tandem with your own doctor at home. So if you're on the fence, if you haven't been getting help, if you have issues that no one has been able to find, maybe you haven't been yet to the blar- kiss the the correct Blarney stone. <laughs> Not that you're full of Blarney or Brolone. <laughs> we always have fun when we get together. I hope That's I get asked awesome. back to yeah, lecture and I can always, hang with you. It's always fun with you, Lindsay. Thank you so much. And if you love information like this, please go to iTunes and leave a review. If you want to know how to leave a review, we're going to have show notes for the show. In fact, I'm going to put the 10 supplements that statins rinse out of your yeah, body. And we're going to, one, which I couldn't remember. Right? We're going to figure out the 10th one, hopefully, by the time we put it in the show notes. So that'll all be in the show notes. And at the end of the show notes are exact steps on how to leave a review. And please tell your friends, any friends with heart issues, you know, not necessarily heart breakup, although I, we know if we have a very severe heart breakup, you do have a transient period of actual heart disease. Um, and please stay tuned. I have a membership launching and I'm um, lecturing. P- stay tuned for estrogen vindication. There's a whole new world of giving hormones to women even high-risk women, you know, there was a 19-year reanalysis of the Women's Health Initiative, and estrogen decreased the incidence of breast cancer by 44%. And it turns out the whole design of the Women's Health Initiative was completely flawed because the control arm, they didn't control for the variable that a whole bunch of those ladies had taken estrogen in their history. So they had an atypically lower incidence of breast cancer compared to the experimental arm. Oh my God, oh my God. Doing randomized clinical trials in medicine, everyone prides himself on it, but you almost can't do it. It's, it's a fallacy. It's a, yeah, it's a complete it's, uh, fallacy. And we've been proven that wrong many times, haven't we? So, you know, what you have here is pure gold. Dr. Mark Houston has spent his whole life studying all this. He teaches it. He puts it in books. When you go there as a patient, you're looked at every which way. And I've hung out with him and his beautiful entourage and he with doggies in the office. He's got dogs all over the office that you can pet and hug and cuddle with. And he really lives what he says. And not everybody who teaches and is a big cyberspace hero does that. So you have my respect and my thanks, and I hope you go out and tell your doctor that they should get his books. Um, that one book that they should get is Integrative, what is the name of that book? Precision and Personalized Integrative Cardiovascular Medicine. And what's the one on the new one coming out on vascular disease? That one's called Vascular Biology for the Clinician, and it's That's- out there. Sorry, vascular yeah. biology for the clinician. It came out a few months ago. Vascular yes. biology for the clinician. Tell your cardiologist about these books. Give it to them as a Christmas gift. Yes. You know, you can't give it as a stocking stuffer because the stock sock will fall down <laughs> too to big, the heart. Too heavy. It'll fall well, to the heart, your, but it'll fill up their heart. <laughs> I just want to hang out with you with a glass of Pinot Noir and laugh the night away. Here we go. Thanks for being on this show. I really appreciate it. Blessings your way. Blessings to you. Bye. Bye there in Nashville. (laughs) Bye-bye. See (laughs) you.